Welcome everybody to the Bucky call. It is September 23rd or 24th, depending on where you are. Uh, and we will be continuing to cover critical path. And uh, Anne, how are you feeling? What would you like to take away from today? I'm glad to be back today. I think I missed about three weeks. Um, mm. So yes, catching up um, today. That's um, what I'm looking forward to. Uh, and hoping to hear from what all of you have to say. Um, yes. And uh, so, Manu, how do you feel and what do you hope to take away today? I feel good. Um, it's early here, but uh, and, and, and forecast is that rain, there's going to be rain. And uh, it's still quite cold in Cape Town, you know, in, 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 in comparison to the past. So we have a wet, prolonged, uh, I don't know if it's spring or winter, but <laughs> there's something happening here. Anyway, what I expect is uh, that we continue on this book and, and then we don't limit ourselves to just the script of a book, that we take what is written that was 40 years ago or 50 years ago, and then uh, that, that, that Bucky wrote this stuff. And then we try to apply it to what are our challenges today. And then we see how we can use to solve uh, challenges and problems that we have in our environment and further. So that's my expectation. So John, how do you feel? What do you expect? I'm feeling great. Uh, it's an absolutely beautiful day in Perth. It is a spring day. There's no question about it. We've got a forecast high of about 24 degrees. I've been for a walk in the park, which is always a fantastic way to start the day. So I'm feeling good, really excited about being able to be here again after an absence of a few weeks. So, uh, yep, just feeling happy. Happy uh, with myself and happy to be here. So... Um, Let's see, Anne's done. Joe, I won't let you go last. Um, how do you feel? What do you hope to take out of today? Um, you know, I feel uh, I feel good. I am actually um, really looking forward to uh, um, kind of continuing. And uh, we were talking about the chrono, uh, Bucky's chronophile uh, and the importance of actually uh, that actually has played in his life um, and helping to understand trends. Uh, and uh, I think that if you look throughout this book, that's what I see. Uh, you know, you see trends that um, happened at the turn of the century and some of them that are reoccurring today. Uh, so I'd like to apply a lot of what we've, um, uh, you know, learned historically over the past few weeks uh, and what we're going to cover here today and apply it to today's problems, much like Manu. Uh, I feel very fortunate uh, that. Uh, and John, that you're here, and Richard and uh, Manu, thank you again for joining. And you know, it's it's always an honor to play, uh, a privilege to have everybody here. So, um, with that, uh, Richard, how do you feel? And what would you like to take away from today? Well, I'm feeling pretty good as as we enter into uh, our fall season. So. Uh, it's, uh, and I've just been spending some time watching what's going on in Slovenia with respect to the International Association of Suicide Prevention. And I saw some pictures that looks like half the country of Australia is there. So uh, you must be feeling all alone, John. It's I know. There and <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I've one of the things that uh, that I want to get out of this is continued sort of the deeper sort of linkage or co uh, connection to <clears throat> critical path, something that I've been through before, but it's uh, never with um, a group read like this. So it's, it's a very different than just reading on your own. Um, talking about chronophile though, in one of the other groups I belong with, the trim tab group, um, we got into the discussion of Bucky's Chronophile and reading one of the books that really actually helps document some of that. So we we embarked on a, a challenge really for uh, each one of us if we wanted to, 
is to align our own chronophile against some of the uh, milestone dates in, in his life and see how they lined up with each other. So that's what I've done. I have I did this uh, uh, several months ago, and I keep trying to keep it sort of updated, but uh, it's really quite intriguing to, to see what he was doing at a particular time in, in his life and what I was doing or not doing if I was even around but so uh i i look forward to continuing that kind of parallel um delve into his work so uh thank you thank, thank you. you uh hi and manud would you like to just mention a, a little bit about heritage day in south africa you mentioned it in the chat so yeah that's how it is 24th of September is the Heritage Day in South Africa, and uh, really aiming to bring, you know, this rainbow nation, you know, from many different cultures together, fused into a South African culture. And uh, I think it fosters tolerance, it fosters acceptance of all the constituents of South Africa as it is. So it's a very special day for us, you know, People have facilities, you know, bring in their peculiarities, share, and do things. That's what it is. Oh, that's wonderful. And uh, thank you for sharing that. And uh, Manu's son re recently got married, if you don't mind me sharing that. So that's also another joy that we have. Oh. So oh, that's you. really, um, thank that's you. a very, uh, thank it's you. a wonderful thing. So, yeah, it was... Um, uh, it was the wedding of many, many continents, you know. That's wonderful. You, know, if you look at the attendance, it was African, Asian, uh, uh, North American, European. And that was it. It was not only representing uh, the couple that was there, but it's also the heritage. And uh, it went on very well. Oh, congratulations, so, Manu. Congratulations. That sounds like a beautiful right. event. And um, we're, um, I'm, we're all happy for you. So with that, uh, uh, we will get started uh, where, where we left off uh, last week. Um, and we will be using my Kindle book uh, as opposed to the Word file, uh, which we'll see how that that's, you know, more... Is that uh, if that works better or not? Um, let me just do something really quickly and make sure I have. Can you see that, John? I can see that. Yes, we're starting at the bottom of the page. Are we as already related? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Want me to start? So, whenever, yep, whenever you're ready. As already related, in 1907, I started a chronological record of my life and in 1917, named it the Chronophile. In 1917, at the age of 22, fortified with the already thick Chronophile, I determined to make myself the special case guinea pig study. In a lifelong research project, i.e. documenting the life of an individual born in the gay 90s, 1895, the year automobiles were introduced, the wireless telegraph, and the automatic screw machine. That's that's called then, government. <laughs> automatic <laughs> screw machine. That's quite right, Richard. <laughs> were invented and x-rays were discovered. Having his boyhood around the turn of the century and maturing during humanity's epochal graduation from the 19th century, which closed Sir Isaac Newton's normally at rest and myriadly isolated hybrid world cultures to which change was anathema into the 20th century and Einstein's normally dynamic, omni-integrating world culture to which change has come to seem both essential and popularly acceptable. Though I lived within seven miles of Boston center, so rare and new an object was the automobile that I was seven years old when I first saw one. I first drove one when I was 12. Operators licenses and owners registration certificates did not come into official use in any states until a decade later. <clears throat> when I was born in 
When I was nine years old, the aeroplane was invented, but I did not see one flying until I was 14. And I did not fly one until I was 22. Within which same year, 1917, I heard the historically first human voice conversation over the radio. Earlier in that extraordinary year, the USA had entered the World War I. I had entered the US Navy and Anne Hewlett had entered into marriage with me. <laughs> Big year. The cumulative effect of the swift succession of epochally surprising first ever, for me, human and personal experiences, precipitated my previously mentioned inauguration of the history of the evolution of guinea pig B, B for Bucky, the chronophile. Along with millions of other pre-Kitty Hawk juveniles, I too had tried to invent the aeroplane, first with paper dart models, and then with box kite-like multi-planed gliders. Despite our elders' doubts and engineering's down-to-earth negatives, imminent invention of the aeroplane was everywhere present in the thought world of my pre-Wright brothers' knee breaches years. It is interesting that our latest supersonic and 2,000 mile per hour planes are beginning to take on the overall shape perfection of those early paper darts. Children's intuitions are keen. <clears throat> My extraordinary experiences with the US Navy's World War I galaxy of new tools, oil burning turbo electric ships, aircraft, diesel engine submarines, radios, automatic range keepers, etc., convinced me that the experience pattern of my generation was not to be just one more duplicate generation in a succession of millions of generations of humanity with an appropriate imperceptible degree of environmental change as compared to the immediately previous generation. I was convinced that, unannounced by any authority, a much greater environmental and ecological change was just beginning to take place in my generation's unfolding experience that had occurred cumulative between my father's grandfather's great and great great grandfather's four previous generations. I had read their diaries, expense accounts or letters containing descriptions of their lives in their successive undergraduate days in the Harvard classes of 1883, 1843, 1801 and 1760 respectively. They all told of days long walking or driving trips between Cambridge and Boston. I realized intuitively that the subway, which opened in my 1913 freshman year to connect Harvard Square in Cambridge to Tremont and Park Streets in Boston in seven minutes, was a harbinger of an entirely new space time relationship of the individual and the environment. It was clearly the environment and not the humans that was changing. And though the environmental changes might not alter human genes, changes in their external conditions might permit humans to realize many more of their innate capabilities than heretofore. Humans are tool complexes, hands for certain tasks, feet, ears, teeth, etc., for others. Using their human tool com complexes, human minds comprehending variable interrelationship principles, invert, detached from self tools, sorry, invent detached from self tools, unannounced by any authority. Oh. oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah, it, d invent detached from self tools. The bucket go. can lift out more water than the well, from the well than can a pair of cupped human hands that are more special case effective, but not used as frequently as their organically integral tools. Humans invent craft tools and industrial tools. The latter are all the tools that cannot be invented or operated by one human. The first industrial tool was the spoken word. With words, humans compounded their experience one knowledge. Most industrial tools are driven by inanimate energy rather than by human muscle. <clears throat> the dwellings are environment controlling machines. So are automobiles. Automobiles are little part-time dwellings on wheels. Both autos and dwellings are complex tools. Both autos and dwellings are component tools within the far vaster tool complex of world embracing industrialization. I use the word industrialization to include all inter-coordinate humanity, all its artifacts, artifacts, its evolving omni-interfunctioning and omni-integrating 
omni life support producing capability. I do not demean the phenomenon of industrialization by identifying it as being the money making business that exploits productivity for unilateral profit. I do not identify the biologically the biological complexity cow and its ecological support system as being a component of some dairy business. <clears throat> Industrialization is not businesses mass production of weaponry and munitions for political proliferation and personal profit. Industrialization's productivity is exploited by business, but industrialization's coordinate productivity can be employed directly by spontaneous cooperation of humanity without business profit motivation. Life continually alters the environment and the altered environment in turn alters the potentials, realities and challenges of life. Environment embraces a complex of non-simultaneously occurring but omni-integrating mutations of humans external only by invention realized metabolic regeneration organisms, which we think and speak of as industrialization. Why, why don't we stop there and uh, open it up for comments or questions? Does anybody want to share their thoughts on what we've covered thus far? Thank you, John. Mm. About uh. the ecosystem changing or essentially anything about the energy in particular? Uh, or even how industrialization has been harnessed to be uh, the areas that I, I find to be interesting. But anyway, Richard, were you about to say something? Yeah, I was just, uh, again, kind of looking at or drawing the, the parallel between uh, the Wright brothers and Alexander Graham Bell in terms of uh, flight machines, and they were both within one or two years of each other. Um, and what it, it makes us wonder whether they knew anything about each other's work or whether it was one of these synchronicities, synchronicity uh, situations where the um, the the whole thinking and idea of being able to fly, just as Bucky said. Uh, he was trying to do something in that area as well. So something seemed to be happening in that early 1900s that brought people uh, closer to the realization that uh, a flying machine was more than possible. Um, yeah. I, uh, yes. You know, I, I just made some little notes here of words that you were using. And I see the general thing is that uh, it seems to embrace, you know, like 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 it, it, it is sustained by Becky's, I will call it Becky's geometry. Let me not bring the word too early. But well, let's let's start with first chronophile. Hmm. So chronophile, beginning you know nothing, and by experience you record. So that's a brain function, just keeping records. The chronophile. So, and then it says, change is first hardly. That's what I noted here. Perceptible. When he says his generation in the succession of all millions of generations that existed, in spite of looking about the same, is different. I don't know if you remember that. His generation is different from the others. Mm -hmm. That brings me to the fact that change always starts at the boundary. Right. And then there is the work of leverage and compound. He talks about those two things. That is quite 
um, powerful. And then in the same breath, it talks about industrialization and cooperation. Kelly will always say, your agreement is a tensile strength of your of your of your social system. Your agreement is a tensile, tensile strength of your of your social system. And say and 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 what what is really really uh, taking it home here is life continuously alters the environment, and in turn. The altered environment in terms alters the potentials, realities, and challenges of life. An environment embraces a complex of non uh, simultaneously occurring but omni integrating mut mutations of humans external only by invention. I don't know if you read, read this one, but this summarized to say. What we call universe is always changing and universe is finite and it's changing because universe of the greatest environment, which is what we know, is continuously altered by what surrounds it. And that is called the boundary. Mm -hmm. And because what surrounds it always and the change and then our experience is is omni, is non simultaneous. You know, I have experience here. You know, uh, uh, I'm, we all constituent of this universe, has an experience, but it's there. But the knowledge, our awareness of it is not simultaneous. It's non simultaneous occurring, but omni integrating. There's something that integrating this stuff. And this to me is very, very powerful. So, the substance of what I'm saying is that already here, you could see all the tenets of Bucky's approach to things, the pulsating uh, nature of the forces that govern us, you know, radiation, gravity, and all those dualities intervening, environment, and potential. Your potential is within. But what I do affects the environment. The environment in turn affects me and uncovers, if properly, a kind of, if I were aware and properly directed, our potential. Or sometimes even, you know, unbeknownst to us. And that is uh, what Susan would call type one evolution. We uncover things doing other stuff. And then we realize that in type two, that it is according to generalized or general principles. That's type two evolution. I will stop there, Marshall. Thank you for that very much. Um, I very much appreciate the way you uh, related the boundaries uh, with the change in the environment. Um, and I actually just thought of what something I had had a conversation earlier this weekend about how boundaries were actually changing uh, and how, you know, going from an industrialized economy to a knowledge based economy, uh, the boundaries are actually, you know, changing. Um, and even the way we learn in general within that framework is actually interesting. Uh, we, I talked to someone earlier this week about the evolution from uh, rote learning to uh, more of uh, retrieval of information and learning, um, meaning, you know, kind of search and just uh, and, and things along those lines. And now we've gotten to a point where almost it's like a prompt with these new tools that are coming out, uh, we're we're prompting uh, the, t the technology in order to learn. And what I'm just saying is that how things have changed, how we interact, and how we actually take in information, 
and uh, and there's a it, it and how we evolve. It's similar to what Bucky is talking about here in the sense that I see similarities in the sense that how the environment itself was changing, but the boundaries are changing and also how we interact with the technology and how we actually um, live our everyday lives changes as well. Um, that's just something that had come to mind for me anyway. Uh, so Richard. Yeah, it just struck me right now that um, one of the important things that Bucky often argued was is that when you have a person in their environment, you and there's a problem in that kind of relationship, that you shouldn't uh, try and reform the individual, you should try and reform the environment to benefit the in individual. You know, that's sort of like, instead of... Uh, um, having uh, uh, people with disabilities have to adjust to the awkwardness of a kitchen counter being too high for them. If you want, if they're say in a wheelchair, you should make adjustments to that environment to accommodate that individual. The parallel though seems that in that same concept, the industrialization process that we're talking about kind of changed that and said, well, yes, reform the environment, but that translated into exploit the environment for the benefit mm -hmm. of the few. Um, I'm just wondering whether that's, uh, it's, this is the first time it really struck me that that kind of parallel is there. Both want to reform if you want change the environment but one wants to reform it to benefit the individual and the other wants to um, exploit it to benefit the, um, I don't know, the capitalists, let's say, uh, or the privileged few. Um, I don't know what to put it out for people's thoughts it's on a, that. Yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah. yeah, but I'd, I'd like to add something. <clears throat> I'd like to add to what Richard was saying. Is talk, um, was just sharing, yeah, because um, how Bucky has actually expanded industrialization, right, to include this all intercoordinate humanity, all its artifacts, its evolving omni interfunctioning, omni integrating, omni life support producing capability, right? I really like that because um, the way industrialization has been defined is so mechanical, right? And it's about manufacturing and so on. So this is, this is um, for me, something. And, and I want to connect it because this uh, whole couple of weeks has been a bit of a, a ride for us. Um, and I'd like to share with you something. I, I drew a, you know, a sort of integrated something here. Um, you all have, you've heard of unicorns, right? Companies yeah. that are. Yeah. Billion dollars. Um, yes. Have you heard of zebras? No. Okay, good. So um, <laughs> I actually told Alibaba, people at Alibaba uh, during COVID, yeah, because I was in their training, uh, and I called Alibaba a unibra. Okay. So if you if you uh, key into um, if you key into Google, Google a uh, zebra uh, unicorns versus zebras you will get this uh, table. It's like pink blue table. And it is a comparison of both a unicorn and a zebra. And zebras are like the opposite of uh, a unicorn. So because unicorns go for monopoly, uh, zebras are about collaboration. Unicorns are about, you know, um, uh, uh, what do you call? Uh, you're benefiting a few versus zebras are looking at the public and the community and so on, right? Um, unicorn, another one is about zero sum game, you win, lose, and zebras are about win, win, etc. So there's a whole table right there. But what is fascinating is I, I, for the longest time, I knew the table, I know it very well, but I never really looked into the article. And the article says, zebras uh, fix what unicorns break. So I went in to read the article uh, just the other day. Uh, anyway, so 
um, I, I realized that Alibaba, they, they, they're making a lot of money, but at the same time, they really impacted the community uh, in China, all the way to the rural areas. The, the, and rural areas are not small in China. Nothing is small in China. It's the towns, they brought uh, progress there and, you know, uh, products could go in, products could come out. So people were staying back in their, in their villages, etc. Um, so that, that's the reason why, you know, I kind of, and, and it's about the user, users, users have to benefit, users have to profit, users have to succeed and thrive and, you know, grow in their businesses. So they, they did whatever it took to help. So anyway, there was still, there are many, many companies, of course, there are Unibras, not just Alibaba. But in the article, it actually says that um, a lot of, they went and checked into, uh, into business owners and realized that, you um, most zebras are women and minority communities groups nice. okay yeah so uh, and but there's a pr huge problem and and that's exactly why i'm stuck right now um if you're looking at the world of business there is this um we are stuck between profit and non-profit and that comes back to the past the, the weeks huh? uh before i was away uh, we were talking about you know the uh the corporate in the, the corporations and so, etc., right? And so, the whole idea of um, of a zebra, we're stuck in the middle of profit and non-profit. So the profit makers will find the uh, in those focused on profits, they they, they see that okay, um, okay, you know what, your business is not fast enough, right? It's taking too long because they could they can easily invest into companies that generate a return ROI within the space of six months, and I don't know to what percentage, right? Um, and that's like if they put money into a pre-IPO within six months, they'll get back like twice or three times what they put in. So, um, and that's the struggle I've been on for the past um, uh, five years, actually, because we were talking to uh, bankers and, you know, investment bankers and PEs and VCs and, and people who put money into uh, these uh, instruments, right? Um, and until I saw this article, it was like, wow, such an eye opener that we're really, really kind of stuck in the middle there. Uh, and and uh, those who give money to nonprofits, they are on course causes that they, they, they are on. Um, the other thing they also talked about is that for women, uh, possible to get small investments, like maybe to the tune of 500,000 USD, but to get the, the money that's big. In Malaysia, it's the same thing, it's probably limited to maybe 500,000 US dollars or less, um, ringgit or less, but um, to get the big amounts to make the change that needs to happen within the organization to impact people, only 3% of women. And it's worse for uh, 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 people of color, it's 1% to be able to get uh, this, this kind of investment. Okay, so um, I just thought I'd put it out there. And But finally, the good news is um, there is a uh, one gentleman in Malaysia, uh, those titled people, one of them is, uh, it, we call them Tan Sri's, you know, probably uh, kin to a sir in, in uh, like really high level, um, what do you call? Um, a knighthood. Uh, titles, titles, yeah, titles in a our country, man. right? Uh, they're, they're like, just below a tun, a tun is somewhat uh, we give it to someone like a prime minister, and just just below that. And so, um, this Tantri, he is actually coming on board and is putting in money. Um, and finally, I think we're gonna get to where we're gonna go. All right. So I just want to update you. It took us such a long time to get here, and he is uh, he's he's very very blunt. One of those. Malays who are really, really blunt with what's right and what's wrong, and he doesn't suffer fools, that kind of thing. And he will uh, tell people exactly what they think, what he thinks. Um, so we're very, very happy to have him on board. Uh, and finally, uh, the zebra, <laughs> the zebra <laughs> took us the longest time. Okay, so I know that there's just something there, and I really like it that. Um, this industrialization is now including so such a is encompassing something way 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 bigger. Um, and to move forward from here. Okay, um, yeah. Really, mm -hmm. I thank you. I wanted to make a comment there. I thank you for that. But my question is to to everybody here: is this for how long 
can an individual entrepreneur sustain his organization being a zebra? And can he last long or can he be spontaneous for long without some kind of put it regulation in place? I say that in light of most things that started. You know, if you take the big of today, especially the technology space, they all started with those ideas of building zebras. Yet, on observation, <clears throat> as they grow bigger, they become people who want to flee from this planet to go to other planets. Mm. They become these guys who will inordinate um, power vis-a-vis -vis others. So how do you guys see that? I don't know if it is anything that is worth uh, putting on the table of discussions or yeah. it's Manu. completely... Manu, um, I just want to share with you right now uh, because I, I'm speaking. I just, uh, last week, I got to speak at this uh, platform called Shift. Uh, shift Education Malaysia, and I got to speak in. I'm, I'm going to be speaking in, uh, in in Indonesia very soon. And last week, I just give me a minute, yeah. Uh, God house. Okay, boleh kasih masuk yeah. Thank you, God house. Delivery, food delivery, lunch deliver, delivery. So, uh, what happened was I I got to speak in Thailand as well. Um, this is amongst education groups and the industry players out there for uh, all sorts of industries. So our drive right now is we got to build and nurture Unibras. So it's about both and not one or the other. Um, and, um, you know, they, they have to make, they have to create economic prosperity for the country at the same time to impact the people the public and the communities. And so I'm speaking on education platforms now and I'm up there saying that um, we have to nurture Unibras. And I, uh, the MOE has just visited our school because the, the Prime Minister has just mandated that the MOE look at international schools because they must be doing something right uh, because the Malaysian parents are willing to pay for education and they are... Uh, they don't even want the free ones, right? So they've asked. And um, so our school got nominated and uh, MOE just came and it was the first school that they came to. And they said that um, they over and over again, they've heard from the from people, even inside the MOE, that to come see our school because it's very, it's not just interdisciplinary. They call it transdisciplinary, uh, but I call it interdimensional education that we created right so they came to see us and um and i told them like we got to integrate we got to get people to be able to impact countries economy at the same time they need to be zebras so it's not one or the other it really has to be both okay yeah there you go you see uh the y combinate combinator uh and so on yeah there that's an accelerator yeah. that was run by Sam Altman uh, at one point. Let me just, uh, I'll be back. Yeah, I'll be back. Just give me a minute. Sure, sure. Um, so, yeah, I, no, I, I think that this is actually a really interesting point that Anne's bringing up and actually relates directly with what Bucky had just said um, uh, with the way things are actually, and actually it's been consistent with what Bucky has been talking about, the way we finance um have financed even uh, the automotive companies, but the way finance industrialization had actually changed, uh, you know, going from, uh, you know, more of a, only worrying about the profits uh, versus worrying about the product itself and the service it's providing. Uh, and that's actually kind of how the businesses actually got taken out of the hands of the entrepreneurs. But these are some examples that are pretty interesting. Um, mm -hmm uh related to unicorns and zebras uh that 
uh, I would thank you, Anne, for bringing this up because I think that this is a um, something that I'm going to learn more about, uh, all the way to the point where I might even lead a meetup on it. Um, mm. Because I really think that this is actually worth exploring in detail. Um, but I put the link to the chat where this the article can be found. It's through the Center for Humane Technology, uh, which who's uh, run. It's run by um, Tristan Harris, who uh, does a lot of good work. Uh, was an ex Google engineer, uh, and was mm -hmm. very much. Um, uh, appalled by the way technology companies were manipulating populations and um, uh, and how they were uh, exploiting youth. Um, and uh, he had started, again, his own nonprofit called the Center for Humane Technology um, in, in order to uh, kind of come up with some meaningful reforms. He has testified before Congress, but Anyway, um, uh, some of the downsides of technology, but this is covered by his website. So, thank you, Anne, very much for bringing that up. That was that was wonderful and uh, really um, uh, exposed me to something I was just completely unaware of. So, can we, can we pa pause for a sec here? Sure. Um, we've got the posting of the zebra and the unicorn chart and it seems to be coming from Stephen and we've got the AI assistant on so is something happening in terms of our discussions and references to certain things and it's coming through from Stephen in terms of where this uh, chart and whatnot is coming from so Stephen is me I'm logging in through Stephen's okay. account <laughs> so that, so that's you, me. So you're uh, you're uh, finding all of this and putting posting it. Do you think it's through Stephen? Okay, good. Thank you. Hey, I it's wish I had really that much hair. <laughs> well, the re reason I asked because the the blurb from the Otter Pilot says that there will be uh, notes for the meeting <laughs> and updates as we move along. So <laughs> I'm curious about. Uh, what I never got to. honestly. I, I you know Steve. So let me start to share. Steve actually shares uh, uh, allows it that that I don't know um, Otter AI or whatever it is, in. So I I permitted it to come in. Um, uh, there's another one he told me to opt out of, uh, which is a Microsoft tool. Um, mm. I don't know <laughs> what the deal is with that. I this one was from Peter Odenau, and Peter who used to be a member. He's still on the list. And John, uh, you're talking about Peter and um, yeah, Peter was before you, Joe. Oh, Peter was really? this, you know. So 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 he's. I think he's based. He's based in uh, Brisbane, right, John? I can't remember. Peter Peter Odenau, right. Hmm. You remember Peter? I mean, I thought uh, I did. I just should remember Peter. He was mm -hmm. with his wife. Yeah, Peter his and his wife. wife. His, okay, his yeah. His wife yeah. was from uh, yes. uh, South America. South America, yes. 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 I think it's the one I saw. It looks to me. I heard. I, I read the selectively that I am the assistant to Peter Denner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it was that Peter, but maybe, way, they, I don't they, know. Maybe somebody's yeah. impersonating, but that's what is written <laughs> there. Well, anyway, I'm, I, I'm I'm good. I'm glad to know that Stephen is Joe. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> it would be a little. This it is a little creepy. Um, yeah, even when I'm posting, I'm like, oh wow, that's not me because <laughs> I guess I'm, I post something and it's like that's Steve that's smiling back at me. Um, but okay, shall we continue? Thank you, Anne, for that. That was uh, really that was very, very helpful for me. Um, so shall we continue? Yes, our Harvard, our Harvard, our, our Harvard, yep, yeah, 1917. Yes, our Harvard 1917 class of 700 
had only three automobile owning members at its 1913 freshman start, one of whom was Ray Stanley, whose father had invented and produced the Stanley steamer. But it was even then at least wishfully clear that humans in general might sometime acquire automobiles. Since that time, I have owned successively 43 automobiles, three of which I invented and built, and have personally driven the 43 cars, a total of one and one quarter million miles. I have lived long enough in various places to have had my cars registered in different years in 10 different USA states, I assume it's going to say. I have flown one and one half million miles, part of that distance in three of my own planes. I have owned many boats, travelled in many others, and have commanded several craft in the United States Navy. My total travel by land, sea and air aggravates more than three and one half million miles to date. In the last 22 years, my work has taken me completely around the world 47 times, making it more economical and efficient to rent automobiles locally than to own them and leave them sitting in airport parking lots. Consequently, I have rented over 100 cars in addition to the 43 I owned. This is in no wise a unique record. It is fairly average for millions of humans who have responsibilities in the general frontiers of evoluting world society. Three and one half million is paltry mileage for any senior Pan American Airways pilot. Every astronaut with only two weeks away from Earth has traveled over three and one half million miles. That's pretty mind stopping. Pre-1900 average world man covered only 30,000 miles in his entire lifetime, which is only 1% of my lifetime mileage to date. In 1900, no human thought assumed that acceleration existed in human affairs, i.e. sociology, sociologically. In 1960, there is no longer, sorry, in 1980, there is no longer valid dissent from the concept of an accelerating change in the affairs of humans on Earth. The average USA family now moves out of town every three years. My present official address for passports and taxations is in Maine. I have had successive voting privileges in eight states. Whether I am in residence or not, my land, my house, you two and I will constantly around the Earth's axis together at about 800 miles per hour in the latitude of New York City. As all the while, our little spaceship Earth zooms around the sun at 60,000 miles per hour, while at the same time our solar system rotates in its nebula merry-go-round at hundreds of thousands of miles per hour, none of which celestial arena travelling did I include in my previously stated lifetime mileages or in those of other Earthians. In all reality, I never leave home. My backyard has just grown progressively bigger and more global. Until now, the whole world is my spherical backyard. Where do you live and where and what are you are progressively less sensible questions. At present, I'm a passenger on spaceship Earth, and I don't know who I, I don't know what I am. I know that I am not a category, a hybrid specialist specialization. I am not a thing, a noun, I am not flesh. At 85, I have taken in over a thousand tons of air, food and water, <laughs> which temporarily became my flesh and which progressively disassociated from me. You and I seem to be verbs, evolutionary processes. Are we not integral functions of the universe? In 1917, in the US Navy, I had intuited that an intermultiplicative historical acceleration of technical events was beginning that would bring about a fundamental and cataclysmic reorientation of human life in universe. Accelerating, ex accelerating acceleration had been discovered by Galileo in about 1600 in respect of free falling bodies, out of which, with other discoveries, he formulated his first laws of motion. But the first laws of motion had not been conceived of initially or since as being applicable to human sociology, as accelerating our ecological evolution, until I intuitively hailed it as doing just that in 1917. 
discussion of acceleration in economic, sociologic and ecologic evolution did not begin in the intellectual publications until more than a decade later. Also, two decades before publication of others was my 1922-1927 discovery that ever higher tool performance per unit of pounds, time and energy input as metallurgical and electronic fallout from the weaponry industries into the domestic consumer economy was resulting some totally in pro providing progressively ever more energetic performances with ever less weight and volume of material per function, as well as ever less energy expenditure per each unit of overall performance in the domestic economy. I discovered this erstwhile weaponry support contractors. I discovered this when erstwhile weaponry support contractors sought to exploit their US government paid, scientifically instrumented and production tooled new factories. When those factories and all their government developed tools were returned to the companies after World War I's armaments contracts were terminated. In contradistinction to the successively greater performance gains with ever less pounds and volumes of materials, ergs of energy and seconds of time per each unit of performance strategy employed in designing ships environment controls of the sea and sky for the military, the dry land building economy had theretofore been prototyped by fortress and castle building. Increased environment security was to be accomplished only with more weight and masonry massiveness. The heavier, higher and thicker the walls, the more the security attained. In 1917, this more performance with less weight and volume of materials, less ergs of energy, and less seconds of time investment per each accomplished unit of performance, manifested itself for the first time in the metallurgy, chemistry and electronics of World War I C and sky armaments developments. This newly observed phenomena seemed to me to put in question the absolute scientific validity of Malthus's 1805 discovery that humanity is multiplying its numbers at a geometrical rate while increasing its life support capability only at an arithmetical rate, as a consequence it, which it was universally concluded by all eco-political power system masters that only a few humans are designed to survive successfully. Conversely, it seemed to me that it could come to pass through more with lessing that all of humanity might become both physically and economically successful even within the foreseeable future. There is not a chapter in any book in economics anywhere about doing more with less. Economics traditionally, economists traditionally try to maximise what you have, but the idea that you could go from wire to wireless or from visible structuring to invisible alloy structuring did not occur to them at all, it was outside their point of view, beyond their range of vision. Economists are specialists trained to look only at one particular thing. In my Shelter magazine of 1930-1933 and in my 1938 book, Nine Chains to the Moon, I identified this progressive doing more with less as ephemeralization. Though Fortune magazine also published my 1922 concept of ephemeralization in its 10th anniversary issue of 1970 in a prominent manner. And despite ephemeralization having subsequently wrought epochal advancements in the standard of living for 2 billion previously deprived humans, ephemeralization is a phenomenon that in 1980 is as yet largely unknown to or overlooked by the world's professional economists. Nevertheless, the combination of accelerating acceleration and ephemeralization has now elevated 60% of all humanity from its year 1900, 99% poverty level into realization of an everyday standard of living superior to that enjoyed by any kings, tycoons or other power commanding humans prior to the 20th century. Sailors watch for every clue nature may be give, nature may give to coming events, cloud formations, temperatures of the water, wind direction shiftings, etc. To survive, 
navigators must anticipate comprehensively. The sailor's subconscious, as well as conscious faculties, interact mm. to inform his anticipatory decisions, only intuiting the subsequently realised ep epochal, epochal significance of accelerating ephemeralization to be implicit, as already noted, I decided in 1917 to scientifically document its emergent realizations as they impinged upon the daily life of an, of an individual, his family and his world. Lots of tongue twisters this week. My 19... Uh, well, actually, do we want to do we want to maybe stop here? Does anybody have any comments? Uh, and I think we covered quite a bit with this last thing. Um, yeah, the concept of ephemeralization is is quite critical, and I it think just so. keeps accelerating. If you look at the um, capacity of the very first um, mobile phones, and then look at what you do with your phone now, what it's capable of doing the material required, the capacity. I mean, I bought a mobile phone in the 1980s, the late 80s, and it was a brick. It had to right. be screwed to a lead every time I got into the car. It was just a phone. That's all it was. And it, from memory, in 1988, it cost me $3,000. I, I remember that Gordon Gecko phone. It looked like something out of Vietnam. It was like, you know, where you're like something that was huge it was like a yeah but Mano, you want to like to say something yeah i want us to note that he's writing this in 1979 yeah he's 85 year old bucky died just shy of the 88th right it was the officially died at 87 so that's three years later and bucky died in in uh, in uh, 1983 i think 1983 yes yeah. so what is particular about him is the unfailingly recording of his experiences and mm, trying yeah. to put that into does this data that i have is there any trend is there anything that embraces something that is general principle. Who of us, I cannot surely, I don't remember how many miles I've ever driven to Milletti <laughs> and where I've driven. Right. Yeah. I can't. I don't know, and I, I will bet here. I don't even remember the last time I drove. Anybody knows <laughs> where, you know, he's driven and how much he's driven. That is one point. Hmm. The second point is us to realize do you know what accelerating acceleration is? What is the dimension of accelerating acceleration? It's four. Four day. In mechanics, in mathematics, when you calculate acceleration is a square polynomial, right? It's square. Right. Now, if you make the derivation of that again, it's another two. It's two by two. It mm -hmm. is this that we always see. It is the famous Richard what? Tetrahedron. That's what it is. Oh. Accelerating acceleration of bodies. So that's dimension four. Right? Mm -hmm. And it talks then about the combination of accelerating acceleration. That is the gravity. You know, do you know that gravity and acceleration? Gravity is an acceleration actual fact. So the, the combined effect of accelerating acceleration and ephemeralization, which is doing more of less, that is dividing. So you have, in total, gravitation and radiation working together to write, to exercise this, to result in this powerful way 
of transforming our capabilities. Now, when we transform, if when we become aware of those capabilities, what we do of in our little environment is something else. And that has been a struggle of humankind. Fire, do I use fire to burn around me? Or do I use fire to refine around me in a certain way that it benefits in a balanced way? All constituent. And, and, and it is, was a problem yesterday, it's still a problem today. And to me, that is quite incisively and quite powerful. I stop my sharing here. That was amazing. And, I, and that's something I'm actually going to go back and listen to. Um, I have something to add, but if anybody else wants to add anything first, please. That, th thank you for sharing that, Manel. That was. He's talking uh, about wireless in 1979. But the way you captured the, the uh, yes, uh, is how the, is he? That, how is he aware of that imminent transition? I understand the military. If the military had discovered it, they would not share with Becky. I don't think so. No. Uh, basically, if you consider what was the subsequent relationship with Reagan administration. It wasn't somebody that the military were in trust with uh, their secret. No. No. <laughs> so it is by painfully and painstakingly recording and exchanging, cooperating. You record, you accumulate, and then you radiate. And the tensile strength of those two things is cooperation. And then you become aware of things that are underneath, hidden. But our world is sustained by something. And those are general principles. I mean, there's, a, there's so much those things. So there, something that is actually been on my mind in relationship to ephemeralization, and I have not thought this through yet. Um, and actually, you know, I think you probably will have an answer for this. Um, the cost of technical debt. Technical debt. Technical debt. Um, and I'm saying this in terms of like what the Navy is doing now. Like uh, they're spending on things that they don't need they're maintaining ships that oh, they don't yes, need yeah, it, yeah, like yeah. so it's this this mm. you know because of po political reasons um, oh it's almost completely and, political it, it, but but does it, how that impacts the ability to do more with less you know mm. overall because well, essentially the military is spending more and getting less. They literally are legitimately spending more and getting less. But Joe, um, Bucky did some figures, I think it was in the 1980s, and I think I've mentioned this before, where at the time he did the figures, the expenditure on what he called killingry, armaments mm -hmm. and defence around the world was about $1,000 billion. And his calculations indicated that for just over a quarter of that, for a bit over $250 billion a year, we could deal with reforestation, we could deal with providing clean drinking water to every human being right. on the planet. Um, but we could make a huge significance, a huge improvement in the life of every human being on the earth for a bit over a quarter about of what we were spending on armaments and defence. So the cost of the expenditure on armaments and defence. And I hate to think what it is now. I mean, Australia's just committed to $380 billion of expenditure on submarines. I know. $380 billion on submarines. We've got 25 million people. It's insanity. And so 
what we could do to improve the standard of living of people with medicine, with water, with reforestation, with um, cleaning up the environment. Um, it, the, the cost to humanity of the expenditure inappropriately is huge. I, I came across something this just recently that that is that was quite revealing to me and it encapsulates the conundrum in which we are and that that Anne in particular here in this group is trying to dent is this one there's the expression that I can take you to the water I can't make you drink the water and put that in the context of you know, bringing everything to everybody. Will everybody accept it? And, and, and the comment that kind of caught my mind was this one. He said, the issue is, how can I make you test? So it's more, my responsibility is more than, or whatever, taking you to the water. How do you get test? To me, meaning, <clears throat> how do you get motivated to see that where I'm taking you to is something beneficial to you? How do we quit surrendering, surrendering our responsibilities and accountabilities to people or organizations that are basically ignorant right. of what is, how would I call it, reality? You know, when I say reality, it means what is natural. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying here? Yes. In most of courses where we that we attend, you know, and I've attended a bunch, you know, people like blessingers, you know, in sales and all these people. They will always say, I can take you to the water, I can't make you drink water. I mean that you have to be motivated to wanting mm -hmm. what is on offer. And in order but, for you to be motivated, yes, John, let's go. I was just gonna say, but at least you can give people the opportunity. At yeah. the moment, there are so many people in this world who don't have an opportunity. But, but what I wanted to emphasize is that it takes the fight, I will say, the cause that Anne in particular is taking to make those. Because when we judge, when we assess Birkin saying that, okay, his predictions didn't come true, it might be because that aspect was overlooked. It takes a lot to undo the damage Right. That ideologies right. have inflicted on individuals. In other words, to move you out of a group is so difficult. It's twice more difficult than putting you in the group. And then it takes at least that amount to help you to shift. <laughs> And, and all the ideas of, we we're talking about critical mass, the 65%, you know, that is invisible, come to be here. And it's cost, there's a cost to it. And that cost goes, you know, if you want the change right. that occur, we have to be able to have people that impact in their communities in such a way that that acceleration can happen. Mm -hmm. and can accelerate that critical mass atten attendance. Let me use the word. How do we attain it? I haven't found it but, easy. The, no, it's not easy. I mean, I, I think it's, it's very interesting. There's a lot mm -hmm. of things that are going through my mind right now, but coming back to the chronophile and I, the idea of being able to understand trends and even be able to articulate the story itself uh, as to what has occurred. Um, that's, that's a very important thing because I, 
one of the things that I think that pen, people people have uh, obviously short memories, and that's where mistakes actually can reoccur. And so sometimes articulating that story, but I'm just thinking in terms of what actually we were talking about, where Bucky may have miscalculated a little bit. And I've thought about this, and I'm trying to think about it some more. Is that uh, I think he over valued technology and underestimated the political systems getting in mm. the way of progress. Mm. I really think he did. Um, yes, that's he assumed that reason and compassion for one another would would accelerate progress uh, beyond political obstruction. He underestimated the political obstruction. Mm. Exactly, exactly. And that's and so that's one of the reasons I brought up the idea of even technical debt that exists because it exists because of the political structure. It doesn't exist because of the technology itself. Um, people would disregard and move on, you know, they're, they're, they're and I, I, so I just sent everybody an article The you know, the Navy would move on tomorrow, if they, but they have uh, political interests that are maintaining ships or not retiring ships or maintaining shipyards and doing all these things. And so they're spending more and getting less. And I think that that's something to, to in, think about in general when thinking about the calculus of ephemeralization in general. On that point, if we go back to the American Civil War, I think from memory that that was still uh, one of the most destructive wars in terms of the loss of human life for the number of people right. involved. But out of the American Civil War came so much technological advance, medical advance, and just following on from what you were saying, Joe, just think about the what the Ukrainians are currently doing with drones in attacking the Russian Navy. Drones in boats, drones in the air. Um, the Ukrainians, so out of the aftermath of the um, Russian-Ukrainian conflict, are we going to see a huge change in military thinking? That, in fact, may accelerate what that article is talking about an old mindset that's not keeping up to date with changes because one of the things that article says is these big expensive ships are going to be beyond the government's ability to fund and maintain in the future and and in fact i think it was bucky who wrote that we should no longer be mining iron ore from the earth because there's enough steel now above the earth's surface to be recycled to meet all of our needs I mean, I think the um, Russians have fleets of old ships that are anchored there, millions of tons of scrap steel that would be better off recycled and used to manufacture new things without engaging in iron ore mining. So we keep, again, that's for political reasons, because the Western Australian government collects a fortune in taxes from the iron ore miners. The iron ore miners make a fortune, but we don't even need to be doing it. So we could reduce the damage to the environment by recycling all the steel that's above the Earth's surface at the moment. Just, yeah. Well, it, and why, it is politics. And it's not as if Bucky were, was completely blind to this because he <laughs> did talk about in earlier chapters uh, when somebody had talked about having a more efficient way or a way of recycling. I forget the exact quote and I'll look it up. Mm -hmm. um, but uh where the owner of the shop said get this person out of here because they you know you're basically impacting my sales uh, as a way of actually saying that recycling didn't necessarily make sense anyway so it's not as if he was wasn't blind to that to that um to to the the incentives being misaligned uh, so that, where, where does recycling come from as a word? In in Bucky's parlance, how did he discover the importance of recycling? Can you put that in parallel with patents? In did cycles? This come out of his, did it come out of his study oh, of yeah. pollution and his, his definition of pollution? Exactly. Yeah, he studied pollution and he, he wrote about pollution. Yes. And he defined it as something like 
some particle that hasn't been able to complete its cycle. Um, isn't that it right? powerful, John? Hmm? That isn't it powerful that is conceptual geometry hmm. led him to that, to even hmm. willing to research. It's like you do a theoretical model and you predict something, like Einstein did with something, and then it gears the research, the funding into trying to prove that or disprove that. Because you need you need painstakingly tracking things to see that first pollution didn't just go disappear into something, it is in the background, and that things are capable of coming back. And in how long do they come back? And calibrate that and calibrate your needs to that cycle. And then you start seeing other things more complex emerging. So it seems to me to be saying to economists, your models are too short termist. Well, I think there are. Yeah, you, you, you're always maximizing, you know, or optimizing something. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and I think that that even comes back to something we're a little bit we're talking about. It, 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 economists are very specialized and focused on one thing. Hmm. Um, and they're they're focused on whether even if it is profitability or, or growth of some sort, um, they're not necessarily thinking about the whole system. Uh, there are some models that are trying to do that now, look at the environmental impact, um, questioning whether growth is a, an appropriate goal. Uh, or the sole goal, anyway. Not that it shouldn't be as part of the equation, but you know that it shouldn't be the sole goal. Um, but at the very least, what we're what Bucky was calling to attention is uh, when we would think about things linearly, uh, and instead of thinking about things from uh, a whole systems perspective. And I think that that's where he's showing where these models we're going to come up, they did come up short. Uh, so I think that that's, that's, um, uh, but we still have that problem of very narrow and short term thinking, as we were mm -hmm. just talking about. That's mm -hmm. kind of the issues that, that plague us still today. So, um, shall we continue reading? Uh, or does anybody have any other comments? I tell you, these have really been really fantastic comments from everyone. I, I've really enjoyed this. Um, we might not be able to let Steve see this session because it's going really well. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, here we go. One basic. Okay, or the first important. That's why. I think it's oh, the first go. important. Wow. Okay. <laughs> My nineteen seventeen project guinea pig B was greatly advantaged by the Dymaxion chronophile. As of June nineteen eighty, the chronophile consists of seven hundred and thirty seven volumes, each containing three hundred to four hundred pages, or about two hundred and sixty thousand letters in all. The first important regenerative effect upon me of keeping this active chronological record was that I learned to see myself as others might and usually did see me. Second, it persuaded me 10 years later, 1927, a decade after inception of Project Guinea Pig B in 1917, to start my life as nearly anew as it is humanly possible to do. One basic tenet of my new 1927 volition, as already mentioned, was that whatever was to be accomplished for anyone must never be at the cost of another. Robin Hood, whose story my father read aloud to me when I was very young, and not long before my father died, 
became my most influential early years mythical hero. This mm. meant that in my first life, I had improvised methods in general to effect swift moral and romantic justice for those I found in trouble or danger. Foolishly self-confident in my first life, I had have often rushed thoughtlessly to assume responsibility beyond my physical, monetary, or legal means to fulfill. This rashness led me into complex dilemmas for in attempting to keep my assumption of responsibilities legal, I inadvertently involved my unwitting family, dragging them into preposterous financial sacrifices. In inaugurating my new life, I took away Robin Hood's longbow, staff and checkbook and gave him only scientific textbooks, microscopes and calculating machines, transits and industrialization's network of tooling in general. I made him substitute new inanimate forms for animate reforms. I did not allow Robin any public relations professionals or managers or agents to promote or sell him. It seemed obvious that if the new tools that the new Robin Hood developed could provide valid human advantaging increases, they would inevitably be adopted by society during the successive inexorable economic emergencies, which dictate the proper rate of regenerative gestations of evolution. Mm -hmm. Along with the Dymaxian chronophile, I have kept all the tear sheets of newspapers, magazines, programs, etc., in which my work was reported. Until 1970, I could not afford to subscribe to a clipping service. Most of the clippings I have came into my hands by my own discovery or as a consequence of friends and acquaintances. Spontaneously, sending clippings to me. This record now contains over 37,000 articles written and published by others about me or my work. It begins in 1917. Half of the 37,000 unique items have been published in the last 20 years. The record does not include the radio and television broadcasting about me or my work, which radio and TV broadcasting is both local and national are ever increasing averaging in 1972 at two per week for an annual rate of 100 broadcasts, varying from one minute to an hour each. Published herewith is a curve showing the precise number of separate and individually written items per annum appearing only in the New York, only in the New York Times from 1920 to date. It is a curve of many peaks and valleys. Altogether, it constitutes a wave pattern of ever increasing magnitude. The cumulative record patterns into a ski shaped curve, an initially long, almost horizontal pattern with its nose finally rising ever more swiftly. It is an accelerating acceleration curve. The successive peaks relate to my Navy days, my 1918 publication of Transport Magazine, my 240 stockade buildings, of 1922 to 1927, the 4D monograph and the Dymaxion House of 1927 to 1928, my 1930 to 32 publication of Shelter Magazine, the 1927 to 35 Dymaxion Car, the 1927 to 38 Dymaxion Bathroom, my 1938 book Nine Chains to the Moon, the 1927 Industrial Man's Ecological Transformation Charts, Lifelong Energetic Synergetic Geometry, the Dymaxion Deployment Unit produced by Butler Manufacturing Company of Canvas City in 1970, the 1930 Dymaxion Sky Ocean World Map, first published in multicolour in an 18-page section in Life in March 1943, 1946 O Volving Bookshelved, Underground Silo Library, 1947 Geodesic Domes, My World Around Geodesic Radomes for the Defence Early Warning System, My 1957 Marine Corps Air Delivered Geodesic Domes, My USA Moscow Pavilion Dome, My USA Pavilion for the 1967 Montreal World's Fair, My 1967 Triton Tetrahedonal floating city for the US Housing Authority, 
the 1965 to 75 World Student Science Design Science Decade, 1927 Inventory of World Resources, Human Trends and Needs, my 1969 World Games, i.e. how to make the world work, as conducted that year at the New York Studio School, Yale University, Southern Illinois University, University of Southern California, University of Pennsylvania, University of Massachusetts, New York University, my 1972 and a half mile high Mount Fuji high housing sightseeing tower, completely engineered but never built for Matsutaro Shoriki, later owner of Nippon Television Network and the Yomiuri Shimbun, Japan's largest circulation daily newspaper, the 1960 to 73 World Man Territory Trusteeship inaugurated on Cyprus under joint auspices of Archbishop Makarios, Kares Crosby, the World Academy of Science and Art, and myself, my large scale tensegrity projects, my 18 books, especially Synergetics, volumes one and two, scientific publications by others identifying my work with discoveries at various levels of the microscopic microcosmic structuring of nature, and most latterly to a general admixture of editorial realizations that my separately reported inventions and fundamental concepts all relate to a total uniform unified philosophy that now emerges as comprehensively pertinent to unfolding historical reality. Yes, the curve certainly does accelerate up. Does anybody have any comments or um, want to look at the curve more close, closely? I know, Manu, you're uh, shaking your head about one particular paragraph. Um, no, I'm just, okay. I'm just in awe. Mm. Yeah, I know. It's what Becky, Becky accomplishes. Mm. Yeah, I know. Mm. I'm trying to put together a to-do list. <laughs> I mean, I mean. The preponderance of later items by others relate clearly to my general philosophy, to my 50 year 1927 prognostications and to my world environment redesigning stratagems. There is a dawning awareness that I am saying something realistic when I say we have been asking the politicians to do what only we can do ourselves technologically by cooperative use of our intellects and active initiatives plus our innate politically transcend transcendental integrity and artifact inventing and mass producing capabilities. I have been consistently faithful to my 1917 determination to treat myself objectively as an historical guinea pig. And I assure any who may be interested that my files include as many unflattering items such as notices from the sheriff, letters from those who thought me to be a crank, crook, charlatan, etc. I'm glad that these negative charges are infrequent and to the best of my knowledge, untrue, though the record discloses the ease with which items taken out of context can be negatively interrelated and interpreted. Because my chronophile and archives data constitute a faithfully comprehensive record, I am now able to comment objectively regarding my subjectively disclosed guinea pig self, and I am usually more critically incisive with myself than I am in with studies of other humans. <clears throat> when my subject is being effective, I am glad, and it, when it is worriedly procrastinating, I am sad. When it makes mistakes, I learn the most and am elated. This is the extent of my prejudice. I think the curves plottable from my data are acceptable as demonstrating the realization of the scientific marshalling of my guinea pig's case history as deliberately and methodically undertaken a half century ago. The curves document 
that my 1927 working assumptions are approximately congruent with the ensuing 52-year unfoldment of evolutionary patternings in economics, technology, sociology, and mathematics. My 1927 assumptions, being well published and now actively reviewed, not only are proving valid, but many are also trending to further accredit my present prognosticating. My 1961 prognostications covering world educational developments to 1982, as contained in Buckminster Fuller on Education, now published by University of Massachusetts Press, are tending to be far more comprehensive far more spontaneously accepted than were those of my 4D monograph of 1928, pre-issued as 4D time lock by the Lama Foundation in 1972. Possibly a more telling trend regarding guinea pig B is the acceleration in the curve of the rate at which books by others refer to my work. Books usually represent a greater amount of research work, rumour filtering and retrospective processing than do newspaper or magazine writing. The curve of books with reference to me and my work is accelerating even more swiftly than is the curve of news items published about my work. It has been an expensive and often cumbersome task to keep the records and to hold together the archives that document the half century history of this experimental undertaking which had often to passage penniless times. However, that record keeping has been accomplished. As a consequence, it may serve to encourage others to commit themselves to nature's precessional principles. Few who know me or of me, over and above friends. Yep. From... Um, so why don't, um, uh, why don't we take a uh, okay. just stop right there and then uh, take any comments or questions. I understand him to say, I kept a comprehensive record and it's proved that what I was doing was the right thing. Uh, I, yes, but I, I have another comment here is that if you never fail, you know, you know, if you really want to get anywhere, first, there's that phase of information gathering to a point where you can make a pronostication. Right? Mm. And Becky mm. had it, you know, he had his experience accumulation and he failed. He even mm. contemplated suicide. But there is something that came up to him to make another, to take another bet, make other assumptions, and keep record of those things to buttress the assumptions and they prove right. If I take a parallel of somebody like uh, Ray Dalio, right. he was, he came up very strongly, you know, with some stuff and say, I'm sure this is going to happen. And he failed miserably. He was right. actually almost ruined. And he reformulated his assumptions start studying history, long cycle history, with a hindsight of that failure and experience, made now assumptions that seem to be proven right. Because if you read, hmm. If you read his books in the past five years and you see what is happening today and how the political forces are reacting, it's almost, I don't know if I'm too, it's almost verbatim now, Joe. Could you read it? Really, if you look at it, you could see this scenario that was clearly painted. It was a scenario. Right. But what we live in today is that it's one of the scenarios that he put on paper that seemed to be unfolding. So the lesson to me is uh, experience is very important. 
but also very important is risk-taking, that is making an assumption. And mm -hmm. the third most important is if the assumption is proven false, to have the courage to abandon it and restart right. you and reformulate yeah, something. Yeah. Like you said, the only reason I know more than anybody else I know is because I've made more mistakes than anybody else I know. Yeah. Yeah, the the, the ability to reorient um, is actually, and especially in Ray Dalio's case, um, because I think that if I remember correctly, he made a bet like on the stock market going down after we went off the gold standard. And uh, he said he had not looked at enough history to understand what actually would be occurring next. Um, and he did, he almost he lost a lot of money at that point. Uh, and there's a couple to, to a couple of different times in his career that he um, had those types of failures. But uh, overall, it's that, it's that it's understanding the trends uh, and having the um, uh, enough information to know when you should take a risk and when you shouldn't. I mean, that's essentially what it is. Uh, and uh, and it, you have to have. Well, I don't know if you have to document this much, but you have to you have to really start to document a lot of. You really have to start to retain and organize information in a way that it's actually actionable. So. Uh, it's an important lesson that I need to learn personally. Richard, question. Yeah, I'm. <clears throat> one of the things I'm curious about and have been for some time is, is is this whole um, understanding of the principles of precession. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this our our reading finished on that sentence, uh, right. and yet. We just heard him talking about his um, prognostication sort of skills in gestation periods. Mm -hmm. um, and my understanding, the way he tries to, or why he spoke about precession, it, it was had to do with the inconsequential or the inadvertent consequences of the bee uh, taking up... Um, nectar and flying to the next flower and dropping and pollinating it i've always been troubled by the concept of inadvertent consequences and and have looked at procession as also being um the the axis of the relationship between two or more can create a motion perpendicular to that axis in a um planned if you want way or a determined way or uh, an intentional way so what do you think bucky is meaning by concluding this long section with the sentence about committing ourselves to nature's processional principles richard do you did you did you read what i put in there in the chat Yeah. Yeah. Is that but that's is that inadvertent or is that intentional in terms of the consequence? I think we got to be intentional in doing things. That's it. Intentionality yeah. is a prerequisite to commitment. But the basic principle using the B as the example is always su suggesting that, that was a inadvertent consequence in terms of being able to or of of um, generating or regenerating the uh the pollination factor that the bee didn't set out to pollinate the next flower but inadvertently does when they but go is it inadvertent the or just unanticipated <clears throat> i'm not sure that it's inadvertent it may be unanticipated well, it's a, what happens at right angles to what we do consciously. So if but, I just mm -hmm. going to stay in bed today, I don't know what consequences are going to flow from that action. If I decide I'll get up, get dressed and go to work, but I'll leave half an hour later or an hour later, 
I may miss an accident, I may be caught in an accident, there may be consequences at right mm -hmm. angles to what I'm doing with that I didn't anticipate. I'm not sure it's inadvertent. Well, I think but I'm I I'm also working with it on the idea that this is in a helping kind of relationship. So if you have a an axis between the helper and the helpee, uh, that's that vertical axis. And if they do something, if they zigzag back and forth with each other in relationship, they can create motion that is um, problem to solution, uh, which is perpendicular to the axis of their relationship. That's mm -hmm. how I've been using it. And so I've been using it in trying to to create a, a, a model or a way of understanding what's the power in um, a back and forth relationship between, I'm just using two people now, between, between two people to generate some kind of motion that will move from problem to solution. So, and okay. that's where I think it's intentional. And I ask you a question. Do bees yep. make appointment to meet each other, uh, to to see each other? Yeah, I know. <clears throat> they probably don't. <laughs> okay, so but we make appointment. <clears throat> um, it is to say that if you want the axis of humans' activities is geared towards if you want to be to achieve something you should be geared towards what you call anti-entropism is anti-entropy in that we consciously engage in activities that might not be in train yeah. with what it is so by doing that, we are we can be whipsaw by nature and to extinction. Mm -hmm. So we want to engage into things that in a way that nature does not whipsaw us because nature doesn't care about us. It doesn't. Let, let, let's just be humble enough mm -hmm. that nature doesn't care about humans. Without human, nature will still be, because it has been in the past without humans in the form that we have today. So in our short life, in the cycle of evolution of nature, we want to act mm -hmm. consciously in a way that we align with those forces. Yeah. But I I, I, take it, yeah. I take I take a certain amount of exception to that in terms of what Bucky was doing to try and discover the function of a human being in a regenerative universe. And when I look at what he was saying, then I have to say that nature does care. And nature does want uh the human function to work the way it's supposed to. Unfortunately, it's not doing what it was uh, placed here to do, so to speak. So in that sense, and but I do agree that nature can get ticked off uh, with the experiment and say, uh, so long, <laughs> I will Let's survive get into without this you. Let's experiment, Richard. Yeah. Let's get into this experiment. One, two, three. You know, I have green, red, yellow here. I have a pencil here. I have another one, pen here. Each of them can write. Me, nature, I can read all of this. But you, this one, can only write green. I can dispose of that for my function. I will still go. So I can decide to put this one on store in the back, back burner. And I'll go with this four. It doesn't change anything because I'm conscious that I have it installed and I use it when I want. 
humans are this. You be this. The bee is this. Other guys are the lion is this. The tree is that. History, nat natural history is being him in the arc of life. Is still going. It is something beyond our dimensions, as you did, in my opinion. So that's what it is. So I come to it to say that nature can get rid of us and continue in whatever that he has to continue. So he doesn't care about us. We care about it. And, and Becky defined it, the function of humans specifically as being local. is local gathering and, and, uh, and uh, uh, what word does he use? Problem Gather solving. Yes, local problem solving in support. Yeah. It doesn't say it's a sole support, in support. No. Okay, of the non simultaneous and eternally regenerative universe. <clears throat> so also, we got the information. The word, the word in the information. We, we know it, we store it, we transmit it locally. Now, if we want, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I'm not competent what? to go beyond this. What? But yeah. let's let's you know it's twelve uh, fifty three here, which um, I don't know where the time it is for everyone else, but we're seven minutes to the top of the hour, so why don't we go around and uh, yeah. do takeaways? Uh, and uh, so, um, why don't we start with um, John? How do you feel? And what would you like? Uh, would you? What's your takeaway for today? Thank you again for reading. That was a lot of reading, and it was well done. Harder than normal. Um, it was good. Uh, it stimulates the brain. It uh, actually has provoked some thoughts to me about redesigning my firm. Um, we really need to make some major changes about the way we operate. We have too much office space. It's too expensive. We have fewer people spending time in the office space. Um, we need to ephemeralize and fairly significantly. So I'm going to take some of this and apply it to my own situation. But it's always good to be provoked. Um, Bucky may have been writing... 40, 50, 60 years ago, but uh, most of what he wrote is timeless in terms of its connection with nature and the way we function and our evolution and ephemeralization. So, yeah, I've enjoyed it. Um, good to interact, good to see you and share ideas. So I'm, I'm happy and got some things to think about. So, Anne, you look too serious. Um, <laughs> how do you feel? What do you take out of today? Uh, okay. Thank you, John. Um, okay, for me, uh, the, the way I look at life, uh, it's, it's more fatalistic, I think, would be the word. Uh, it's up to us. If we mess it up, that's it. We just go. <laughs> and uh, nature it won't, won't, won't even uh, notice. Okay, the point is it won't notice. And I and so, actually, I have a poem I'd like to leave you all with. Um, it's, it's called Grass by Carl Sandburg. Okay, if you just key that in, I don't know if you've heard it, uh, but it really kind of puts... Uh, who we are historically at the um, world level, nature level, yeah, the nature history of nature uh, puts us in put, puts us in perspective. Okay, um, so uh, I just want to just share that um, we need unibras, not more zebras. We need unibras. I feel that in order for us to create that commonwealth that we've been discussing here uh, so fervently. It is unibras we need, and therefore we need to nurture them. And the last one is um, uh, the, the whole thing about accelerating, acceleration, and then accelerate, which is ephemeralization. And then there is accelerating ephemeralization. So what does that even look like now? <laughs> you know, uh, I think that's fascinating uh, to, uh, to, to, to take further. And so thank you so much, um, you know, to Joe, Manu, John, and Richard, because I've taken down quite a lot of things here to ponder on. Okay, uh, over to Richard. How do you feel and what is your takeaway today? Well, I, I, I feel pretty good. I'm 
I guess what I'm really taking away is the the spirit of dialogue and and out of the the dialogue uh, in a Bohemian way is what I think <clears throat> maybe John was getting at is that out of that dialogue between two or more um, that there can be uh, a generation of an unanticipated sort of result that actually comes out of genuine listening and hearing back and forth between two or more people. That that's <clears throat> that fits with my kind of understanding of procession as uh, in in looking at it from that way, and it fits with this idea of of something that can be unanticipated, which probably is um, a better term for me to be working with than um, the uh, inadvertent word. Uh, so I, I thank um, everybody for our discussion in that regard and, and John for bringing those two words into focus for me to um, pay, uh, attention to what comes out of that kind of a pure um, Bohemian kind of dialogue with no preconceived sort of outcomes on either side's part. Yeah. So thank you. And uh, <clears throat> where are we going here? Damanu, um, how are you feeling and what are you getting out of, or what are you taking away from tonight's session? I feel I feel my just my energy increasing. I'm so grateful. It's such a you know it's it's called get on the good food in the morning. You know it's very early morning for me, and I don't know. I pity you guys. Maybe you already spend so much of your day, you know, in a way that is not as rewarding as this caller for me. But I'm grateful to everybody for that. A few things I take away is the importance of record keeping. Mm. The importance of long cycle history, precise history. And we discussed this before. You know, you cannot grasp the truth. The truth is never on the immediately following cycle of the event. Truth and objectivity require many tests. It only reveals itself in a truthful manner long after the event because the biases dis dissipate and the substance of it come out. So those, those, the importance of long history, long cycle history that we know. Second thing is uh, I was really, really uh, impressed by the combination of accelerating acceleration and ephemeralization. Right? And, 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 and that is really powerful. And then I also got that the requirement, um, objectivity requires a large database. That sit also a little bit with really the importance of recording and accumulating facts or what seems fact for a while before you can see a trend. And then the humility of reviewing one's positions. Once it become clear that the tenets of the opinion or the position that we have don't hold anymore. It, it comes, you know, it comes. So, so you have those worlds of love, humility, and risk-taking that weave together to shape the type of human that Becky is talking about here. Those are my takeaways. And I'm, I will endeavor to, lead, to read this grass by Carl Sandberg, the poem that Anne uh, mm -hmm. suggested. So, um, who's now? Is it Joe? No, no. It's Joe, huh? Joe, yeah. do you feel what you take away? Um, you know, it's funny. I, I have a lot of a couple of the same takeaways. Uh, hang on. Uh, just marking our book. Um, I have a lot of the same takeaways that, uh, that, um, have been mentioned already. Uh, specifically, uh, the acceleration um, 
of uh, uh, acceleration uh, and how that related to uh, specifically uh, ephemeralization. Um, also, the idea of actually, uh, again, the importance of capturing information, documenting information, and staying aware uh, to um, where uh, we are, um, you know, at, at, at any particular moment in time, and being re willing to reor, you know, reorient our our perspective. Um, I think that that's a really important point. Uh, a lot of times we get locked in to looking at things in one particular way. Uh, but I think that uh, the more information we document, the more we take in, uh, the more holistic we'll be in our analysis. Uh, there are two actually uh, odd things that I, I would, I'm actually going to plan to lead a meetup on uh, in, in, in the future. Um, you know, one has to do with travel. You know, I know the, the idea that, you know, Bucky had actually talked about the uh, all the, the traveling that he had done. But, you know, there's travel is kind of a there. There's a balance to it. Um, you know, it impacts the environment. <laughs> uh, and so there is that uh, the, there is an element to uh, that we have to consider when we think about that. But it gives us new experiences and, and uh, exposes us to new uh, cultures. So there's that part of it too. Uh, there's also the price part of it that has come down over the years. That's well documented. How much we even pay uh, per mile, um, and so that there's some very good data in Enlightenment now by uh, Stephen Pinker. So <clears throat> that that's one meetup. The second meetup is um, uh, unicorn versus zebras, and really understanding that. Uh, that is something that I think that is uh, I, I've been, you know, looking over a little bit more and more as even uh, as we've been sitting here this evening, uh, and that's extremely intriguing to me. Um, so, uh, and I think that that's something to really dive into uh, as to the benefits um, uh, to, to zebras versus uh, unicorns. And because sometimes also there's a lot of negatives that I've heard about unicorns in general, about how they can be overvalued and along things along those lines. Um, so that's something I really want to dig into. So I have two meetup topics that I, I actually feel like I'm walking away with. Um, so with that, I really, really enjoyed this session. Um, it's an honor to be here with everyone. Steve, we missed you. Um, we always miss Kelly. Uh, so, but uh, I really, it was a privilege. Uh, John, thank you again for reading. Love the dialogue, guys. Um, and uh, it's just good to see everybody. I, I, you know, it's it's 1 a.m. here, but um, I'm not tired. So that's a good thing. So uh, I'm feeling pretty good about things. Uh, but um, and if anybody wants to, uh, and yes, yes, um, uh, I'm very much missing Susan. I'm very much missing Susan. Um, yeah, so we had the privilege of seeing her Wednesday, but uh, or talking to her. So, uh, but yes, anytime Susan's not present, I miss her. Uh, all right. Well, everyone, I have everybody have a great week and I'll see everybody back here hopefully next week. Um, hopefully everybody can join. And uh, thanks for making me smile. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, take care, everybody. It was really Thank fantastic. You. Yes. Bye. It was Thank a great you, Joe. session. Take care. For holding the space. I thanks, Joe, for holding the space. And I found one quote that I should have shared, but I'm going to put it up there. It was a quote that I had referred to earlier uh, about the prophet uh, the prophet quote about how there's a lack of incentive to re recycle um, and I finally found it it was earlier in the book anyway mm. so 
uh, I, I'll, I'll talk about it next week because I actually I noted it. Um, okay, I've copied it. Yeah. Thank Take care, you. guys. You too. Have a Bye. Bye. Yes.